This is just a graphic picture of what lung volumes look at. And we're looking at, at how that air in your lungs is distributed. Um, and this is the normal person again, and again, this is me. Uh, this essentially is the number from the first test um, force vital capacity, except we call that a slow vital capacity because um, because emphysema patients have a hard time getting the air out of their lungs when we do that force test, uh, we, we will let them do one where they can just blow at a little more comfortable pace and they get a little more air out. So we call that a slow vital capacity. It's not really slow, but it's not really forceful like that first one. The amount of air that's left in your lungs, after you've blown all the air out that you can blow out is what we call your residual volume. In people with res re restrictive lung diseases, that's going to be small. In people with obstructive lung diseases, that number gets big. And it, it, it's air that's trapped inside your lungs. It's not doing you any good. But if we know the amount of air that you can forcefully blow out of your lungs, and now we've been able to determine the amount of air that's left in your lungs, we have what we call your total lung capacity. And that's what this number here is, total lung capacity. And again, we're looking at how that air is distributed inside your lungs. This is the diffusion capacity. It's the other test we do that most of you are familiar with. And it tells the doctors whether the oxygen that you're actually breathing in from the room air is able to move from your lungs into your bloodstream. You can breathe in a lot of oxygen, but if that oxygen's not able to get into your blood and to circulate throughout your body, it doesn't do you any good. This is a very small little alveoli. It's just one of millions, but here we have a, a little bronchial. It's a little tube that's that breathing in oxygen. It's inside that little air sac. This little air sac has a very specialized membrane. It allows oxygen to move from your lungs into your blood, and it also allows carbon dioxide that's in your blood to move back into the little alveoli so that you can exhale it. That membrane in a number of lung diseases it becomes damaged. It can become damaged in emphysema, uh, especially in uh, pulmonary <coughs> fibrosis. Um, so you breathe in oxygen, and that oxygen crosses that little membrane. And that little membrane is kind of like peeling an onion. You know, when you peel an onion, you peel the layers away, but there's that tiny little thin skin. And that's kind of the way this membrane is here on the alveoli. Oxygen comes in, the oxygen crosses into your blood. These are actually little molecules of hemoglobin that are in your blood. It's going to pick up that oxygen. These are unoxygenated. It picks up the oxygen, and then the blood flows through your body with hopefully plenty of oxygen in it. And that's diffusion. That process of that oxygen moving into your bloodstream is called diffusion. Again, the patient's sitting in the box, but the door is open. The uh, patient has a nose clip on, takes several normal breaths, and then exhales. And the reason the patient is <coughs> exhaling, you want them to get out as much air as they can because when they inhale, they're going to inhale a mixture of gas. And one of the gases in that mixture is carbon monoxide. Now, carbon monoxide likes to get into your bloodstream very quickly. It's a trace amount, it's not enough to hurt you. You suck in that deep breath, you hold that deep breath for eight seconds, and then you exhale. Now when you exhale, that machine's going to throw off some of that air because it's what we call dead space. It's in the part of the lungs that diffusion doesn't occur. But towards the end of your exhaling, it's going to take a sample of what we call alveolar gas. And it's, go it's going to analyze carbon monoxide in that exhaled air. Now, there should be less carbon monoxide in the exhaled air because while you are holding your breath, most of that carbon monoxide should have moved into your bloodstream. And we can calculate the rate at which that diffusion takes place. 
And this is my diffusion capacity. Uh, it was 21.91, which is 90% of what was predicted. You don't have to be 100% to be normal. Anything above 81 is normal, so my diffusion capacity was normal also. So now we know what normal people look at. Let's look, oh, I did have a test I wanted to talk about, excuse me, muscle pressures. These are tests that actually measure the strength that the muscles in your chest exert when you're breathing. Most of us are really not aware that the muscles in our chest are helping us to breathe. Um, there are uh, certain diseases that <coughs> cause these the uh, muscle pressures to become weak. Uh, we measure inspiratory pressure, how hard you can suck in. We measure expiratory pressure, that's how hard you can <laughs> blow out. And these are recorded. We do probably three or four of each one of those maneuvers. These are my muscle pressures. My muscle pressures are extremely good, as you can see. 167 was predicted. That's actual predicted, 119%. And inspiratory, 175% of predicted. We'll talk a little bit more later about what kind of diseases where you find these abnormalities. Now, let, we're going to look a little bit at uh, what pulmonary function tests look like in people with obstructive disease and what they look like in people with restrictive disease. I'm going to talk about the obstructive ones first. In obstructive disease, there's increased resistance to airflow. The air's not moving in and out of your lungs as easily as it should. And it makes it difficult to breathe. And those diseases that we call obstructive Diseases are asthma, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, um, and there are lots more, but these are the ones that people are most commonly familiar with. The total amount of air you blow out, especially in the early stages, is usually fairly normal. As the disease progresses, though, you may not be able to, to blow out quite as much air. But the real abnormality is that you can't get the air out very quickly. The total amount of air you blow out is usually 70 or less percent, the very first second you start to blow. And this is a person, uh, and I gotta, excuse me, grab my glasses just a minute. This is a 79-year-old white male. Uh, first came to our lab in 1999. At that time, he had what we called moderate airflow obstruction. He had severe air trapping, uh, and his diffusion capacity was 58%. This uh, study here was actually done when he came in December. Uh, total amount of air he was blowed out, and, and again, this, in, an obstructive disease can be normal, and it is in this gentleman. He blows out the right amount of air. He's predicted to blow out uh, 3.71 liters. He actually blew out 3.85 liters. He was 103% of predicted there. But where the abnormality is, is the very, how, how much air he gets out that very first second he starts to blow. He was supposed to actually blow out 2.62 liters, and here he is at 1.26 liters. He's only 47% of what he should have been. And this is where we look at that ratio. The first thing the doctor is going to, he's going to look to see what that ratio is. He's going to compare these two numbers. That's only 33%. Um, you only got 33% of his total volume of air out that very first second he started to blow, and he should have been able to blow out 72% of all of his air that very first second. This is what we call obstructive lung disease. We look at this first to see whether obstructive lung disease is present, but we look at this number here to decide the severity of the lung disease. And at 47%, we're going to call that severe uh, obstructive airways disease. <coughs> When you look at his lung volumes, his residual volume, the amount of air left in his lungs, 
4.52, he should have been 2.54. That's 178%. That is severe air trapping. It's air that's left in his lungs. It's stale air. It's air that doesn't do you any good. It, it's harmful to you. Bigger is not better here. On his diffusion capacity, the ability of oxygen to move from his lungs into his bloodstream. Here he is, 12.32, it was supposed to be 29.64, so his rate of diffusion is only 41%. Now we call that moderate, but he's almost at the severe level. Uh, at at uh, below 40 would be considered severe. This is obstructive lung disease. I gave him a bronchodilator to see if I could improve this obstruction. Bronchodilators are used uh, in, in emphysema, which is what this man has, and it was confirmed by CT scan that, that he had that as well as his PFTs. Uh, it might make patients feel a little more comfortable, but it doesn't reverse the disease process. Emphysema is not a curable disease. It's a treatable disease, but it's not curable. And I wanted to show you this because I gave him a bronchodilator treatment with some albuterol and a nebulizer, and then we waited about 15 minutes and we repeated the test. <coughs> In order to be uh, considered significant, you need to either improve the total amount of air you blow out or to improve the speed by a minimum of 12%. He had 5% improvement in the volume and 2% in the speed with which he got the air out. But again, it's not significant. That doesn't mean that, that he should stop taking his bronchodilator. Most people with emphysema do take bronchodilators. Sometimes people feel better, but it really doesn't change the outcome of the, of the results. This again is that picture that I showed you early, the dotted line being what a normal person his age should look like. He's got a reduced peak flow, he blows, he's got this concave picture here. This is typical of what a flow volume loop looks like. In the graphics of the lung volumes over here, this is what he should look like, and this is the residual volume here. You can see by comparison, that the functional part of his lungs is a lot smaller than the, resi than, than the residual volume. The, the working part of his lungs uh, is, is much smaller compared to what's trapped in there that's not doing you any good. I wanted to show you this. This is an asthmatic patient, also an obstructive lung disease, but asthma for many people is reversible. And we mean reversible, we give you a medication and we, we improve the numbers. We make you better. This was a, a, I think this was a female with mild, we call this mild. Uh, her ratio is right at 70. 71 would be what you would want it to be or higher, but it's 70. 83% here, she's in the mild category. Only mild obstructive disease from asthma when we measured it that day, but we gave her a bronchodilator. Total amount of air she blows out now, 21% better. S speed with which she was able to get it out is 16% better. So, reversible asthma. And again, the doctor would use those numbers in evaluating whether his, his treatment is helping you.